Continuing Chapter 10 Ancient Biographia Hermes surnamed Trismegistus R. The thrice greatest intelligencer Hermes Trismegistus who was the author of the Divine Commander and some other books, well, pseudo-epigraphal, but lived some time before Moses. He received the name of Trismegistus, or Mercurius, Terra Maximus, i.e. thrice greatest intelligencer, because he was the first intelligencer who communicated celestial and divine knowledge to mankind by writing. So, Jahota is represented by this, and perhaps, yeah, perhaps the first, and perhaps the person who did this, but what we have now is the representations of those books that are thousands of years later, if not tens of thousands. He was reported to have been king of Egypt. Without doubt, he was an Egyptian. Nay, if he believed the Jews, even their Moses, and for the justification of this, they urged first, is being well-skilled in chemistry? Nay, the first who communicated that art to the sons of men. Secondly, they urged the philosophic work, bees of rending gold medicinal, or finally, of the art of making aurum patabil, and thirdly, of teaching the Kabbalah, which they say was shown him by God on Mount Sinai. For this is confessed to be originally written in Hebrew, which he would not have done had he not been a Hebrew, but rather in his vernacular tongue. But whether he was Moses or not, it is certain that he was an Egyptian, even as Moses himself also was, and therefore the age he lived in. We shall not fall short of the time we, if we conclude he flourished much about the time of Moses, and if he really was not the identical Moses affirmed by so many, Musa, Masha, keeper of the sheep, but Musa relates more to something about water. Um, it is more probable that he was, according to the Egyptian custom, initiated into the mysteries of priesthood, and from thence to the chief governor or king. The Kabbalist of the yogis affirm that Moses was this Hermes, and, although meek, yet it was a man possessed of a great magical power, and a renowned spectacular in, in chemistry and divine magic. A, d a speculator in divine. Well, now, if you have inspired inspirations, like it was clear that Jesus would have had if Jesus was real, or Muhammad, or one of the others, um, then you're not a speculator. You don't get in that position by being a speculator and just being more right than other people. That's not what revelation and inspiration or even spiritual experiences about and that he by divine inspiration on the mount became acquainted with the knowledge of all the natural and secret operations of nature that he taught the transmutation of metals per kabbalah i.e by oral tradition to the jews well a lot of that kabbalah stuff was you know it is certain he was in the Egyptian, even as moses himself also was and therefore the age he lived in we shall not for, fall short of the time if we conclude he flourished much about the same time as Moses. Now, if you connect it to Thoth, we're going to have to say no. No, not at all. Um, quite a bit before. And if he really was not the identical Moses affirmed to be so by many, it is more than probable he was a king of Egypt for being chief philosopher he was, according to the Egyptian custom, initiated into the mysteries of priesthood, and from thence to the chief governor or king. Now, in the mythological king list with the particular numbers to it, I don't know if, like in Aramea, you have some uh, connection of meaning to those numbers, like you have words that can form from those numbers, or, or, or what the deal was there, but um, Thoth and Ptah and Ra and, and, well, it's not Thoth, it's Jahote, you know, um, but, you know, people say Thoth and people say Ra and people, you know, um, people say Osiris and instead of yes here and but it was said they all lived in a, the, you know a sequence of kings and and then there was the uh, 
companions of the face, you know, of the, you know, her, what's the word with her? Um, he was called Tur Maximus, as having a perfect knowledge of all things contained in the world, as his outer use or golden tractate, and as divine commander shows, which things he divided into three kingdoms, fees, animal, vegetable, and mineral, and the knowledge and comprehension of which three he excelled and transmitted to posterity. In Enigmas and Symbols, the Profound Secrets of Nature, likewise a true description of the philosopher's quintessence, our universal elixir, which he made as the receptacle of all celestial and terrestrial virtues. The great secret of the philosophers he discoursed on, which was found engraved upon a Smaragdine table in the Valley of Hebron. Yuna, in his chronology, says that he lived at the time of Moses, 21 years before the law was given in the wilderness. Magu seems to confirm it by saying, Crado, Mercurium, Trismegistum, Sepientum, Egyptium, Pluris, Ant, Pranum. But this of Mugu may be applied to several ages. For that Pharaoh was the general name of their kings, or possibly it may be intended before the name of Pharaoh was given to their kings. For Ah, you know, the great house. Um, which is so, he makes Trismegistus to exist 400 years before Moses, yea, before Abraham's descent into Egypt. While the numbers between the Israelites entering in the time of Moses and the connection to Abraham is actually more of a, a, a symbolic hint at something, but I've talked about that elsewhere. Um, there is no doubt but that he possessed the great secret of the philosophic work, and if God ever appeared in man, or, you know, the Bhavakad Gita talking about God, uh, you know, he sends, or, you know, the avatar is not that God incarnates particularly, it's that God's will incarnates because to bring back the message. So God sends a messenger by inspiring him, by revealing to him in a literal sense. Um, he appeared in him as is evident both from his books and his commander, in which work he has communicated the sum of the abyss and the divine knowledge to all posterity, by which he has demonstrated himself to have been not only an inspired divine, but also a deep philosopher, obtaining his wisdom from God and heavenly things, and not from man. According to the best authority to be taken, Hermes Trismegistus lived in the time of Pharaoh, Israel's tyrant and oppressor, and was not the same with Moses, who opposed Dennis and Jembras. Apollonius of Tiana, you know, one of the historical figures that went in the Paul and Jesus characters of the Bible, with some account of his remarkable miracles, prophecies, visions, relations. Apollonius, Pinaas, was one of the most extraordinary persons that ever appeared in the world. He was born at Tiana in Cappadocia towards the beginning of the first century. At 16 years of age, he became a rigid disciple of Pythagoras, renouncing wine, flesh, and women, wearing no shoes, and letting his hair and beard grow long and clothing himself only in linen, soon after he became a reformer and fixed his abode in the temple of Asclepius, where many sick persons resorted to be cured by him. Being come to age, he gave part of his estate to his eldest brother and distributed another part to his poor relations and kept back only a very small share to himself. He lived six years without speaking a word, notwithstanding during this silence he quelled several seditions in Tecilia in Pamphylia, that which he put a stop to at Aspenda was the most difficult of all to appease, because the business was to make those hearken to reason whom famine had driven to revolt. The cause of this commotion was some rich men, having monopolized all the corn, occasioned an extraordinary scarcity in the city. Apollonius stopped this popular commotion without speaking a word to the enraged multitude. Apollonius had no occasion for words. His Pythagoric silence did all that finest figures of oratory could effect. He traveled much, professed himself a legislator, understood all languages without having learned them. He had the surprising faculty of knowing 
Well, it was transacted at an immense distance, and at the time the emperor Domitian was stabbed, Apollonius, being at a vast distance and standing in the marketplace of the city, ex exclaimed, Strike! Strike! It is done. The tyrant is no more. He understood the language of birds. He condemned dancing and other diversions of that sort. He recommended charity and piety. He traveled almost over all countries of the world, and he died at a very great age. His life has been fully related by Philostratus, but it contains so many fabulous relations that we do not pretend to introduce them in this place. You know, because they're reserving that sort of talk about Jesus, right? These things cleverly imagined full of meaning. They're really true this time, incarnate and... Yeah, the Bible really does say that. Um, there are many who have very readily opposed the miracles of this man to those of Christ, and drew a parallel between them. It cannot be denied that this philosopher received very great honors, both during his life and after his death, and that his reputation continued long after paganism. Well, if you say that paganism is a material culture of dividing up farm plots, oh, perhaps the government wasn't so reasonable in uh, handing off its, uh, you know, conquered land to the Repu uh, those of the republics, or, uh, you know, not the republic, you know what I mean, the in republics dividing farmland for people to live, or but paganism really, really uh, if you say that's some sort of religion, it really, really makes no sense that there was an end to that. Um, what uh, He wrote four books of judicial astrology and a treatise on sacrifices showing what was to be offered to the deity. We must not omit a circumstance which tends to the honor of this venerable person. It is related that Aurelius had come to a resolution and had publicly declared his intentions to demolish the city of Tiana, but that of Apollonius of Tiana an ancient philosopher of great renown and authority, a true friend of, you know, what was considered to be gods, and himself honored as a deity, appeared to him in his usual form as he retired into his tent and addressed him thus. Aurelian, if you desire to be victorious, think no more of the destruction of my fellow citizens. Aurelian, if you desire to rule, abstain from the blood of the innocent, Aurelian, if you will conquer, be merciful. Aurelian, being acquainted with the features of this ancient philosopher, having seen his image in several temples, he vowed to erect a temple and statues to him, and therefore altered his resolution of sacking Tiana. This account we have from men of credit, and hath met with it in books in the Alpian Library, and we are the more inclined to believe it on account of the dignity of Apollonius. For was there ever anything among men more holy, venerable, noble, and divine than Apollonius? He restored life to the dead. He did and spoke many things beyond human reach, which whoever would be informed of may meet with many accounts of them in the Greek histories of his life. See, Bapiscus, uh, I mean, Bapiscus in Aurelian, chapter 24. So Apollonius was a more historical character than Jesus. Certainly writ written about in the same century, and we have that. Um, and we know who actually passed on some of the stuff, rather than somebody who well, I decided to write something down from past generations, and, you know. Lastly, the inhabitants of Tiana built a temple to their Apollonius after his death. His statue was erected in several temples. The emperor, Adrian, collected as many of his writings as he possibly could and kept them very select in his superb palace at Antium with a rare but small book of this philosopher's concerning the oracle of Trophonius. This little book was to be seen at Antium during the life of Philostratus. Nard in any curiosity whatever, render this small town so famous as did this rare and extraordinary book of Apollonius. It's reported that the, the wise prince of the Indians 
well skilled in magic, made seven rings of the seven planets, which he bestowed upon Apollonius, one of which he wore every day, by which he always maintained the health and vigor of his youth, and lived to a very advanced age. His life was translated from the Greek of Philostratus into French by Blaise de Vigners, with a very ample commentary by Arctus Thomas. Lord of Embry, a Parisian, and sometime since, there has been made an English translation of his life, which was condemned, prohibited, and anathematized without reason. Because the existence of such a text was a threat, and was a threat to the faith in Christianity. So, not just for that reason. Petrus de Apano, or Peter of Apana, doctor of philosophy and physic. Petrus Apanensis. Are upon us one of the most famous philosophers and physicians of his time was born 1250 of the common era in a village situated four miles from Padua he studied, he studied a long time at Paris where he was promoted to the degrees of doctor in philosophy and physic, and the practice of which he was very successful, but his fees remarkably high. Gabriel Nod, in his Antiquitate Scola Medica Parisiensis, gives the following account of him. Let us next produce Peter de Apana, or Peter de Abano, called The Reconciler, on account of the famous book in which he published during his residence in your university. Nod takes notice of this in a speech in which he extols the ancient glory of the University of Paris. We have above recited his words at length because they instantly inform us that Peter de Abano composed the great work at Paris which procured him the appellation of the Reconciler. No. It is certain that, uh, you know, we're continuing the quote here, it is certain that physic lay buried in Italy, scarce known to anyone, uncultivated and unadored, unadorned, till its tutelar genius, a villager of Apana, destined to free Italy from barbarism and ignorance, as Camillus once freed Rome from the siege of the Gauls, made diligent inquiry in what part of the world polite literature was most happily cultivated, philosophy most subtly handled, and physic taught with the greatest solidity and purity, and being assured that Paris alone laid claim to this honor, thither he presently flies, giving himself up holy to her tutelage. He applied himself diligently to the mysteries of philosophy and medicine, obtained a degree and the laurel in both, and afterwards taught them, both with great applause, and after a stay of many years, loaden with the wealth acquired among you, and after becoming the most famous philosopher, astrologer, physician, and mathematician of his time, returns to his own country, where, in the opinion of the judicious Scardian, he was the first restorer of true philosophy and physic. Gratitude, therefore, calls upon you to acknowledge your obligations due to Michal Angelus Blondus, a physician of Rome, who in the last century, undertaking to publish the Conciliationes Physi 
Nanika of your Aponesian doctor and finding they had been composed at Paris and in your university chose to publish them in the name and under the patronage of your society. Tis said that he was suspected of magic. Nowd in his apology for great men accused of magic says the general opinion of almost all authors is that he was the greatest magician of his time, that by means of seven spirits familiar, which he kept enclosed in crystal, had acquired the knowledge of the seven liberal arts, and that he had the art of causing the money he had made use of to return again into his pocket. He was accused of magic in the 80th year of his age, and that dying in the year 1305 of the Common Era, before his trial was over, he was condemned as Castellan reports to the fire, and that a bundle of straw, or osier, representing his person, was publicly burnt at Padua, that by so rigorous an example, and by the fear of incurring a like penalty, they might suppress the reading of the th of three books which he had composed on this subject, the first of which is the noted Heptameron, or magical elements of Peter of Peter de Abano, philosopher, now extant and printed at the end of Agrippa's works. The second, that which Trithemius calls Alacidarium Necromanticum Petri de Alabano, and a third called by the same author, Liber Experimentorum Mirabilium de Annulis, Secundum 28, Mansium Lunor. Lunor? Is that supposed to be E? I think it's supposed to be an E then. Um, now it is to be noted that Nod lays no stress upon these seeming strong proofs. He refutes them by immediately after affirming that Peter of Apana was a man of prodigious penetration and learning, living in an age of darkness which caused everything out of the vulgar trap to be suspected as diabolical, especially as he was very much given to study and acquainted with the harmony of the celestial bodies and the proportions of nature and addicted to curious and divinatory science. He was one, says he, who appeared as a prodigy of learning amidst the ignorance of that age, and who, besides his skill in languages and physic, had carried his inquiries so far into the cult sciences of abstruse and hidden nature that after having given most ample proofs by his writings concerning physiognomy, geomancy, and chiromancy, what he was able to perform in each of these, he quitted them altogether with his youthful curiosity to addict himself wholly to the study of philosophy, physic, and astrology, which studies proved so advantageous to him that not to speak of the two first, which introduced him to all the popes and sovereign pontiffs of his time, and acquired him the reputation which at present he enjoys among learned men. It is certain that he was a great master in the latter, which appears not only by the astronomical figures, which he caused to be painted in the great hall of the palace at Padua, the translations he made of the books of the most learned rabbi Abraham Ebn Ezra, added to those which he himself composed on critical days, and the improvement of astronomy, but by the testimony of the renowned mathematician Regio Montanus, who made a fine panegyric on him in quality of an astrologer, in the oration which he now delivered publicly at Padua, which he explained there the book of Afraganus. Now many respectable authors are of the opinion that it was not on the score of magic that the Inquisition sentenced him to death, but because he endeavored to account for the wonderful effects in nature by the influences of celestial bodies, not attributing them to angels or doemons, so that Heresy, instead of magic, seems to have been the ground of his falling under the
the tyranny of the sage fathers of the Roman Catholic faith as being one who opposed the doctrine of spiritual beings. What do they mean? You know, um, the idea that they're be not the, them being psychological instead of spiritual. Um, continuing the as before. Speak to magic and persecuted on that account by the Inquisition, and it is probable that if he had lived to the end of his trial, he would have suffered in person what he was sentenced to suffer in effigy after his death. His apologists observe that his body, being privately taken out of his grave by his friends, escaped the vigilance of the inquisitors, who would have condemned it to be burned. He was removed from place to place, and at last deposited in St. Augustine's church without epitaph or any other mark of honor. His accusers ascribed inconsistent opinions to him. They charged him with being a magician, and yet with denying the existence of spirits. He had such an antipathy to milk that at the very seeing anyone take it, made him vomit. He died in the year 1316, in the 66th year of his age. One of his principal books was The Conciliator, already mentioned. Now, if he was French, his ability to consume dairy was not what you'd expect of, like, even an Italian, let alone, like, a North African or a Hindu or something. Um, if this is true, we read in Tomasini, Alog Vitor, it us stir, page 22. Now it must have mistaken when he says, Peter upon us, being accused at the age of 80 years, died in 1305. For Harris affirms the same upon the authority of Bernardine Scardian. Apollias, the platonic philosopher. That's not a usual color that one sees. Luckius Apollias, a platonic philosopher, publicly known by the famous work of the Golden Donkey, lived in the second century under the Antonines. He was a native of Madaura a Roman colony in Africa. His family was considerable. He had been well educated and possessed a graceful exterior. He had wit and learning, but was suspected of magic. He studied first at Carthage, then at Athens, and afterwards at Rome, where he acquired the Latin tongue without any assistance. An insatiable curiosity to know everything induced him to make several voyages and enter himself into several religious fraternities. He would see the bottom of their mysteries he spent almost his entire estate in traveling insomuch that he being returned to Rome and having a desire to dedicate himself to the service of Osiris. Yes, sir. Um, he lacked money to defray the expense of the ceremonies of his reception. He was obliged to make money of his clothes to complete the necessary sum. After this, he gained his living by pleading. And as he was eloquent and subtle, he did not want causes, some of which were very considerable. But he improved his fortunes much more by a lucky marriage than by pleading. A widow whose name was Prudentila, neither young nor fair, but who had a good estate, thought him worth her notice. He was not coy, nor was he solicitous to keep his fine person, his wit, his neatness, and his eloquence for some young girl. He married this rich widow, cheerfully, and with the most becoming philosophy, overcame all turbulent passions which might draw him into the snares of beauty at a country near Oev, a maritime town of Africa. This marriage drew upon him a troublesome lawsuit. The relations of this lady's two sons urged that he had made use of the art of magic to possess himself of her person and money. They accused him of being worse than a magician. 
means a wizard, or Claudius Maximus, proconsul of Africa. Gessner is mistaken in making Peter Aponus flourish in the year 1320 of the Common Era. Koenig has copied this error, but Father Rapine is much more grossly mistaken than any of them when he places him in the 16th century saying Peter of Apana, the physician of Padua, who flourished under Clement VII, debauched his imagination so far by reading the Arabian philosophers and by too much studying the astrology of Alfragonus that he was put into the Inquisition upon the suspicion of magic, etc. You know, just like the whole Gentile thing, magic was just a word they used for having a different religion, which is not. Si rapin reflex sur la philosophie number 28, page 360. Vossius has followed Gessner, and his book, De... Medicina Omnimata, the Pope John Twenty Second, who was elected in the year 1316 and held the pontifical chair 17 years, and by this we know the age of his physician, but if the year 1316 was that of his death, the conclusion is unjust, neither does it clear Vossius of an error. He defended himself with great vigor. His apology, which he delivered before the judges, furnishes us with an example of the most shameful artifices of the villainy of an impudent calumniator is capable of putting in practice. Besides the accusation of magic, they reproached him with his beauty, his fine hair, his teeth, and his looking glass. To the first two particulars he answered, he was sorry their accusation was false. How do I wish, replied he, that these heavy accusations of beauty, fine hair, etc. were just, I should without difficulty reply, as Paris in Homer does to Hector, nor thou despise the charms with which a lover golden Venus arms. Soft, moving, speech, and pleasing outward show. No wish can gain them but God's bestow. Pope. Thus would I reply to the charge of beauty. Besides that, even philosophers are allowed to be of a liberal aspect. That of Pythagoras, the first of philosophers, was the handsomest man of his time. And Zeno, but as I observed... I am far from pretending to this apology, since, besides that nature has bestowed but a very moderate degree of beauty on me, and my continual application to study wears off every bodily grace and impairs my constitution. My hair, which I am falsely accused of curling and dressing by way of ornament, is, as you see, far from being beautiful and delicate. On the contrary, it is perplexed and entangled, like a bundle of flocks, our toe, and so, on the contrary, it is perplexed and entangled like a bundle of flocks or toe, and so naughty through long neglect of combing and even of disentangling as never to be reduced to order. As to the third particular, he did not deny having sent a very exquisite powder for the teeth to a friend, together with some verses containing an exact description of the effects of the powder. He alleged that all but especially those who spake in public, ought to be particularly careful to keep their mouths clean. This was a fine field for defense and for turning his adversary into ridicule, though in all probability he had given occasion enough for censure by too great an affection of distinguishing himself from other learned men. Observe with how much ease some causes are defended, although the defendant be a little in the wrong, I observe that s some could scarce forbear laughing when our orator angrily accused me of keeping my mouth clean and pronounced the word tooth powder 
as much indignation as one ever pronounced at the word poison, but surely it is not beneath a philosopher to study cleanness and to let no part of the body be foul or of an ill savior, especially the mouth, the use of which is the most frequent and conspicuous, whether a man converses with another or speaks in public or says his prayers in a temple. For speech is previously to every action of man, and as an excellent poet says, proceeds from the wall of the teeth. And if you're somebody that's going to do your rituals and uh, or prayers or whatever you want, want to call it, whatever, um, do them whether or not you can go to temple. We may make the same observation upon the last head of his accusation. It is no crime in a doctor of what faculty soever to have a looking glass, but if he consults, it is too often in dressing himself. He is justly liable to censure. Morality in Apollias' time was much stricter than at present as to external behavior, for he durst not avow making use of his looking glass. He maintains that he might do it and proves it by several philosophical reasons, which, to say the truth, are much more ingenious than judiciously applied. But he denies that he ever consulted his looking glass, for he says, alluding to his ludicrous accusation, next follows the long and bitter harangue about the looking glass, in which so heinous is the crime that Pudens almost burst himself with bawling out, a philosopher to have a looking glass, suppose I should confess that I have, that you may not believe there is really something in your objection, if I should deny it. It does not follow from hence that I must necessarily make a practice of dressing myself at it. In many things I want the possession, but enjoy the use of them. Now, if neither, to have a thing to be a proof that is made use of, nor the want of it. Of the contrary, as and as I am not blamed for possessing, but for making use of a looking glass, it is incumbent upon him to prove farther at what time and at what place, and in the presence of whom I made use of it, since you determine it to be a greater crime in a philosopher to see a looking glass than for the profane to behold the attire of Paris. I shall instance one that shows that in all ages the spirit of calumny has put men upon forging proofs by false extracts from what a person has said or written to convict Apollias of practicing magic and his accusers allege a letter which his wife had written during the time he paid his Boys to her, and affirmed that she had confessed in his, this letter. Bryce was a wizard, and had actually bewitched her. It was no hard matter to make the court believe that she had written so, for they only read a few words of her letter detach from what proceeded to follow, and no one pressed them to read the whole. At last, Bryce covered them with confusion by reciting the whole passage from his wife's letter. It appeared that far from complaining of Elias, she justified him and artfully ridiculed his accusers. These are his words. You will find that precisely the same terms may be either condemn or justify Elias according as they are taken with or without what precedes them. Being inclined to marry for the reasons which I have mentioned, you yourselves persuaded me to make choice of this man. Being fond of him and being desirous by my means to make him one of the family. But now, at the instigation of wicked men, Apollias must be informed against as magician or wizard, and I forsooth am enchanted by him. I certainly love him. Come to me before my reason fails me. He aggravates this kind of fraud as it deserves. His words deserve to be engraved in letters of gold to deter, if possible, all calumniators from practicing the like cheats. He says, there are many things which produced alone may seem liable to calumny. Any discourse may furnish the matter of accusation. If what is connected with foregoing words be robbed of its introduction, 
if some things be suppressed at pleasure, and if what is spoken by way of reproach to others for inventing a calumny be pronounced by the reader as an assertion of the truth of it. Apollius was extremely laborious and composed several books, some in verse and others in prose, of which but a small part has resisted the injuries of time. He delighted in making public speeches in which he gained the applause of all his hearers when they heard him at the way the audience cried out with one voice that he ought to be honored with the freedom of the city. Those of Carthage heard him favorably and erected a statue in honor of him. Several other cities did him the same honor. It is said that his wife held the candle to him whilst he studied. But this is not to be taken literally. It is rather a figure of Gallic eloquence in Sidonis, Apollinaris, Legentibus, Meditantibus, Candelas, Dua, Candelabra, Tenerarunt. Several critics had polished notes on Apollias, Witness, Philippus, Veraldus, who published with very large notes on the Golden Donkey at Venice in Folio Anno 1504, uh, I mean 1504 of the Common Era, which were reprinted in eight volumes at Paris and at several other places. Goddess Kalk, Stuikias, Peter Colvius, John Weaver, etc., have written on all the works of Apollias, Precius, published The Golden Donkey and the Apology separately, with a great many observations. The annotations of Cossabon. Is that the same Cossabon that did the true and faithful relationship? Or is it um, the guy's father or grandfather? Um, or somebody else entirely. I've, and those of Scipio Gentilius on the Apology are very scarce and very much valued. The first appeared in the year 1594 and the latter in 1607. The Golden Donkey may be considered, as Bale says, as a continual satire on the disorders which the pseudo-magicians, priests, pandars, and thieves filled the world with at the time. This observation occurs in Fleury's annotations. A person who would take the pains and had the requisite qualifications might draw up a very curious and instructive commentary on this romance, and might inform the world of several things which the preceding commentaries have never touched upon. There are some very obscene passages in this book of Apollias. It is generally believed that the author has inserted some curious episodes in it of his own invention, amongst others that of Psyche. Horum Kerinoster Ita Imitator Fuit at e suo tenu inamorbilia protulerit attac inter cactera venestissimum ilad psychias uh, apas audion so that ends with a Greek word? This episode of Furnished, Moliere with a Matter, for an excellent dramatic piece, and M. de la Fontaine for a fine romance. Aristotle, the peripatetic Aristotle, commonly called the Prince of Philosophers, or the Philosopher, by way of excellence, was the founder of a sect which surpassed and at length even swallowed up all the rest. You know, because Aristotle and Plato were not the same as Socrates, but they definitely um, continued in the way, like, um,
but how much they agreed with Socrates is, is quite a question. Not but that it has had reverse of fortune in its turn, especially in the 17th century of the Common Era, in which it has been violently shaken. Though the Catholic divines on the one side and the Protestants on the other have run as to the quenching of fire to its relief and fortified themselves so strongly by the secular arm against the new philosophy that it is not like to lose its dominion. Mr. Moreri met with so many good materials in a work of Father Rapine that he has given a very large account of Aristotle enough to dispense with any assistance. Accordingly, I design not to enlarge upon it as far as the subject might allow, but shall content myself with observing some of the errors which I have collected concerning this philosopher. It is not certain that Aristotle practiced pharmacy in Athens while he was a disciple of Plato, nor is it more certain that he did not. Very little credit ought to be given to a certain tradition that he learnt several things of a Jew, and much less to a story of his pretended conversion to Judaism. They who pretend that he was born a Jew are much more grossly mistaken in the wrong pointing of a certain passage occasioned this mistake. They are deceived who say that he was a disciple of Socrates for three years, for Socrates died fifteen years before Aristotle was born. Aristotle's behavior towards his master Plato is variously related. Some will have it that, through prodigious vanity and ingratitude, he set up altar against altar. That is, he erected a school in Athens during Plato's life, and in opposition to him, others say that he did not set up for a professor until his master's death. We are told some things concerning his amours, which are not altogether to his advantage. It was pretended that his conjugal affection were idolatrous, and that if he had not retired from Athens, the process for a religion which the priests had commenced against him would have attended with the same consequence as against Socrates, though he deserved very great praise, yet it is certain that most of the errors concerning him are to be found in the extravagant commendations which have been heaped upon him, for example, is it not a downright falsehood to say that if Aristotle spoke in his natural philosophy like a man, he spoke in his moral philosophy like a god, and that it is a question in his moral philosophy whether he partakes more of the lawyer than of the priest, more of the priest than of the prophet, more of the prophet than of the god. Cardinal Pelagini I'm, I'm not sure which of these pronounce in a Latin way or a Greek, uh, or, 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 or no, 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 Greek way, but the, uh, well, yeah, yeah, um, the, definitely, it's either Latin or Italian or French or something, but scrupled not in some measure to affirm that if it had not been for Aristotle, the church would have wanted some of its articles of faith. The Christians are not the only people who have authorized the, his philosophy. The Muslimin are little less prejudiced in its favor, and we are told that to this day, notwithstanding the ignorance which reigns among them, they have schools for the sect. Well, they're called the Metazolites, um, and the Metazolites put Greek sayings sometimes above the sayings of the prophet. Um, but every people has ignorance amongst them. It doesn't have anything to do with the religion necessarily. Um, you're going to have to back that up if you make claims like that. Um, it will be an everlasting subject of wonder to persons who know that philosophy is to find that Aristotle's authority was so much respected in the schools for several ages that when a disputant quoted a passage from this philosopher, he who maintained the thesis durst not say, France yet, but must either deny the passage or explain it in his own way. It is, in this manner, we treat the Holy Scriptures in the div divinity schools. Well, wait, you're allowed to deny the Scripture? 
Well, there, there's a question when you look at the Bible, which, which verses were actually uh, based on the truth, and which ones were just representative of the truth. Um, the parliaments which had been prescribed, all other philosophy but that of Aristotle, are more excusable than the doctors. Now, it, you're not doing you're not doing his philosophy if you're just quoting him. So. That's for whether the members of Parliament were really persuaded that this philosophy was the best of any, or was not, the public good might induce them to prohibit new opinions, lest the academical divisions should extend their malignant influence to the disturbance of the tranquility of the state. What is more astonishing to wise men is that the professors should be so strongly prejudiced in favor of Aristotle's philosophy, had this had this prepossession been confined to poetry and rhetoric, it had been less wonderful. But they were found at the weakest of his works, I mean his logic and natural philosophy, which in some ways was superior to the Bible in terms of its cosmological planes, but it wasn't perfect. And so therefore people attribute flaws to Islam because people are like, oh, I'm running with the philosophers rather than, uh, and what they've said, rather than... Um, evidence itself. Uh, to be convinced of the weakness of these works, we need only read Gesendus and his Exertitationis Paradoxica Adversas Aristoteles. He says enough. They're against Aristotle's philosophy in general. They convince every unprejudiced reader that it is very defective, but he particularly ruins this philosopher's this philosopher's logic. He was preparing, likewise, a criticism on his natural philosophy, his metaphysics and ethics. In the same way, when he, uh, when being alarmed at the formidable indignation of the peripatetic party against him, he chose rather to drop his work than to expose himself to their vexatious persecutions. In Aristotle's logic and natural philosophy, there are many things which discover the elevation and profundity of his genius. Now, don't use the abusive la language or slander of the other party, but you know, don't, don't, don't fall for these persecutors. We need to keep on having our own authentic opinions. Um, now, if we know that we're, if we, we've been shown to be wrong, we know we're wrong. We should just bounce back and deny what we've realized. But, you know, um, don't let them pressure us. This justice, however, must be done to the blindness of his followers, that they have deserted him when he clashes with Christianity. And this he did in points of the religious consequence, except to maintain the eternity of the world. I did not believe that providence extended itself to sublunary beings as to the immortality of the soul. It is not certainly known whether he acknowledged it or not. In the year 1647, the famous Buchan Valerian Magnum published a work concerning the atheism of Aristotle about 130 years before. Mark Antony Venerius published a system of philosophy in which he discovered several inconsistencies between Aristotle's doctrine and the truth of religion. Well, if you say that there's a difference in belief, but, you know, the Bible says this and this says this, so the Bible must always be right. Well, the Bible is a compiled book uh, edited over centuries and reworking of other stuff, but um, the Bible has contradictions of itself. You know there's more contradictions between the Bible and the Bible? That's about twice as many as the Bible and the Quran. That, that tells you that tells you something uh, something to tell too. Um Pompanatius and Epus had a great quarrel on this subject. The first maintained that the immortality of the soul was inconsistent with Aristotle's principles. The latter undertook to defend the contrary. See the discourse of the Moth Le there on the immortality of the soul and voting in his esteem of Pathos to the Monomania. Tempanella maintained the same in his book. 
the reduction ad legionum, which was approved at Rome in the year 1630. Now, a lot of what was approved or not approved is, uh, you know, political. It was not long since maintained in Holland in the prefaces to some books that the doctrine of the philo this philosopher differed but little from Spinozism. In the meantime, if some Harry Pettics may be believed, he was not ignorant of the mystery of the Trinity. He made a very good end and enjoys eternal happiness. He composed a great number of books, a great part of which has come down to us. It is true some critics raised a thousand scruples about them. He was extremely honored in his own city, and there was not wanting heretics who worshipped his image with that of Christ. There is extant some book which mentions that before the Reformation, there were churches in Germany in which Aristotle's ethics were read every Sunday morning to the people instead of the gospel. There are but a few instances of zeal for religion which have not been shown for the peripatetic philosophy. Paul de Foyt, famous for his embassy and his learning, did not see Princess Patricia Ethera at Ferrara, um, because he was informed that learned men taught a philosophy different from the peripatetic, as treating enemies of Aristotle as zealots treat heretics. After all, it is no wonder that the peripatetic philosophy, as has been taught for several centuries, found so many protectors, or that the interests of it are believed to be inseparable from those of theology for it accustoms the mind to acquiesce without evidence. The union of interest may be esteemed as a pledge to the peripatetics of the immortality of their sect, and an argument to abate the hopes of the new philosophers, considering with all that there are some doctrines of Aristotle which the moderns have rejected, and which must sooner or later be adopted again. The Protestant divines have very much altered their conduct, if it is true, as we are told, that the first reformers clamored so loud against the peripatetic philosophy, the kind of death which, in some respects, does much honor to the memory of Aristotle, is that which some have reported, viz. that his vexation at not being able to discover the cause of the flux and reflux of the Euripus occasion at the distemper of which he died. Some say that being retired to the island of Eubaa to avoid a process against him for irreligion, he poisoned himself. But why should he quit Athens to free himself from persecution this way? Hesychius affirms not only that sentence of death was pronounced against him for a hymn which he made in honor of his father-in-law, but also that he swallowed aconite in the execution of his, sen his sentence. If this were true, it would have been mentioned by more authors. A number of ancient and modern writers who have exercised their pens on Aristotle, either in commenting on or translating him, is endless. A catalogue of them is to be met with in some of the editions of his works, but not this one. Maybe the next problem to finish this chapter.